Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Inside Scoop and Emerald Planet. All the ecology news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's your host, Executive Director of the Emerald Planet, Dr. Sam Lee Hancock. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you on a weekly basis looking around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, technologies, services and products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And also we're looking how we're going to be able to take care of two billion new people, yes two billion new people that are proposed to be on the planet by 2050 so we'll have a planet of 9 billion and possibly 12 to 13 billion by the end of this century. And so we have a gentleman that's really actively working on that. He is looking at what's called regenerative agriculture. And regenerative agriculture, as you're going to learn, really deals with the soils, the water, and the air more than just ag itself. This is uh, Augustine. He goes by Augie and Cruz, founder and executive director of what's called Arlington Green. And I knew you before you even had Arlington Green. Absolutely, so yes. Yes, you did. So it's good to see you again, it's Sam. It's good to have you here, Augie. And thank you for being with us. Describe a little bit for our viewers here and overseas, what is Arlington Green? Certainly. I describe Arlington Green as a sustainable community development organization. Um, we uh, What we seek to do is go into the Arlington community, the Arlington, Virginia community, and work with a whole host of local stakeholders on various topics and issues related to uh, building a sustainable, or actually continuing to build a sustainable community in Arlington um, on a variety of topics, uh, whether it has to do with agriculture, um, food policy systems, uh, continuing education, and even issues related to workforce development and economic development. That's incredible. There's a lot of activity that's going on through that. And of course, you and I have met each other through Bethesda to green yes and there's others mm -hmm. uh, greens and uh our good friend uh, David is uh, actually working with you guys there in Arlington yes, Green. Yes, he is. And tell us a little bit about what really inspired you. What made you so excited that you just had to have it? Sure. You know, you referred to Bethesda Green and um, Dave Feldman, who was a former executive director, actually founder and former executive director, mm -hmm. uh, was my inspiration. Um, you know, he had a really good thing going up there in Bethesda uh, with Bethesda Green. It's still in operation. And I thought to myself, you know, they have a wonderful model and Arlington would be an ideal place for something like that to, to happen. And I felt that I had enough confidence tax and the wherewithal and the the spirit to, to try my hand at it. Well that's fantastic and obviously you've done very well and talking about Bethesda Green and the others that David has helped to work with they're actually flourishing I mean they keep expanding, they are. more membership they are uh, more activity in the communities yeah. and so as far as what's the value proposition for a uh, city area like Arlington which is in Northern Virginia, the United States, and that has its own unique dynamic. And uh, what's, what's different about Arlington and what's different about Nova? That well, makes it such an exciting yeah, place to create know, something brand new. Arlington, uh, for those who, who don't know, Arlington, Virginia is, uh, is an incredibly progressive uh, community. You know, we are uh, been re uh, recently held up as a, as a model of community and urban development. Um, we've got very good uh, local systems for public services and all the rest of it. So, I really felt that uh, given the progressive spirit within the community, something like Arlington Green would really do very well. Now, looking at that value proposition, I want to hit on this again before we move on to, uh, as we're getting into this programming towards this regenerative uh, agriculture. Sure. Because you're in a very urban area, but regenerative agriculture is becoming really a core of urban communities, not only in the United States, but all around the globe. But looking at this value proposition, how do the stakeholders get involved in this? What are some of your stakeholders and how do they feel like that they are actually gaining value by being involved with something like uh, Arlington Green? Well, no, that's that's a good question. And that really goes to kind of uh, what you were asking earlier about the, with the unique value proposition of Arlington Green. I like to tell people that we are, we're neither prescriptive nor proscriptive. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to tell anybody uh, what to do and what not to do. What we see ourselves, the role we see ourselves as playing is uh, a convener. Um, part 
of the reason that I wanted to do something like Arlington Green was that I looked around and I saw that there were a lot of uh, disparate organizations and efforts all working toward making the, 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 the community more sustainable and better. But we really, but what we lacked was a kind of uh, an overall cohesive way of bringing together all of our efforts. Looking at uh, collaborative uh, as another C word, you yeah. hear this all the time. Uh, that's uh, cooperative, uh, but you, you use the word convener. Now, people don't normally use that particular term. How are you defining that, and how does that separate you from what you're doing from all the others that are using the other C words? Sure. So when I say convener, I say I look at it from the terms of from looking at it from the point of view of, you know, I, I identify a particular topic and I look around the community the, uh, and, and say, you know, that group is working on something that's very similar or has a lot of overlap that this other group. They actually don't know about each other or they don't work with each other. I'm going to reach out to both of them. Per proverbial stovepipes. And, and be that bridge and say, hey, Sam, did you know about, you know, Mary over here who's right. working on something? Why don't we all work together to put on a program or mm -hmm. do something and get everyone's name out there? What are some of the events, programs, projects are you actually actively involved in? And then, of course, the very next question is going to be about this regenerative agriculture and how that relates to a very urban area that sure, you are. Sure, absolutely. But some of the other things that you're doing, you had a list of some of the things that you're excited about that you allowed you to you know establish mm -hmm. Arlington Green yeah but what's some of the programs and activities that you've had say over the next last uh, 10 15 uh, months or so. Sure, absolutely. So um, we've uh, been recently working very closely with another local group called Leaders in Energy, and uh, the executive director of that group and I co-hosted a um, a maker event in concert with Tech Shop down in Crystal yeah, City. You can give her a name. That's Jeannie. Oh, right? Janine Fennell, yeah, as a matter and, of fact. Uh, she's fantastic. She's, she's been on Emerald Planet TV. Oh, she's, so. she's great. Um, again, one you know, I, I look to her as, as, as a mentor mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Um, so she and I uh, put together and co-hosted a program at Tech Shop in Crystal City, mm, focused okay. on the maker yeah. economy as part of uh, as part of the economic engine for economic development. Mm -hmm. um, I worked recently with a friend of mine who does B Corp consulting on a, kind of an introductory program again with uh, actually with Arlington Economic Development, um, and then as. You point out we're going to discuss. I, I, Arlington Green co-hosted with the Regenerative Agriculture Sector Accelerator. That's a mouthful on an unconference uh, dealing with regenerative agriculture. Now, what is an unconference? I've been hearing this more and more in the last uh, few months, but uh, now it's becoming vogue. But yeah, you what know, is it? I. I my partner, David Witzel, um, who you'll be interviewing in a, in a moment, I think cringes when I say that on paper it sounds like chaos. And what it is, it's, it's a meeting whereby the attendees are the ones that set the schedule. They're the ones who decide at the beginning of the day what the breakout sessions are going to be. And what this does is it really encourages people to contribute because it's their meeting. And they're going to get out of it only as much as they're going so to put into it. So you're a facilitator. You're this convener, but you're really facilitating this. So you have uh, the schedule. You'll have the facility. Yes. You make sure to take care of all the logistics as far as meals and all those things. But it really, they're going to come in and then who knows what direction exactly. it may actually take, but it's the dynamic of the group. Per and that's that's a perfect word to use. It's the dynamism that an unconference engenders mm -hmm. and really encourages because you've got all these people coming in at the beginning of the day and they're not being led in any one particular direction or another. Um, it can be a little intimidating as I said on paper but it really works uh, like a charm and what it does is it really encourages that that interaction that co that sense of collaboration and networking. Mm -hmm. Now looking at this regenerative uh, agriculture the, the United States we think of its you know vast vistas as far as the land is all that concerned and you know people are living in, mm -hmm. you know out in the countryside we're 80 80 percent urban mm -hmm. and uh, we're one of the highest urbanized uh, societies on the planet even though we're now moved well beyond three million people. Uh, 300 million people. So what's, why regenerative agriculture in something that's a very urban area where you have your location with Arlington? Sure, absolutely. You know, because 
regenerative agriculture isn't just about the, the agriculture as such. It isn't just about the growing of the food. It, it actually has to do with the whole systems surrounding it. So it has to do with energy. It has to do with transportation. It has to do with food policy, which in turn has to do with the well-being of the community. And the term regenerative itself refers to not just extracting. It means putting back into the land, putting back into the community as much, if not more, than what you're taking out so that future generations are going to have at least as much, if not more, than what you're taking out. Yeah, this is actually nothing new to you because the work you started uh, working with in Bethesda Green a number of years ago and now creating this Arlington Green, that's really what you're doing. You're trying to put as much or more back into the community mm -hmm. than what you're taking out of it at that particular time. Yeah. So you're always leveraging these resources, the, the energy, the activities of people and, and the physical things that Absolutely. exist around them. So how do you think uh, this regenerative uh, agriculture is going to evolve based on your years of experience and seeing this process, but in, you know, in different factors? Sure. You know, I, I I think that it's going to continue to catch fire. I think it's going to continue to um, to move forward, especially because you know, to use a cliche, we are a global society. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's the you know what happens in Arlington can be affected by you know the farmer in in Tanzania or the technologist uh, in China. Um, you know, so I, I think that that's it's already we've passed that tipping point. Now, looking at uh, the uh, COP21, the UN protocols now have been signed, have actually become law now. How do you see that fitting into this regenerative uh, agriculture as far as addressing climate change and the severe impacts that we're already facing on the planet from climate change? Certainly. Um, you know, I look at it um, as, a, as a beacon of hope. Um, that you know, so many, um, so many other countries are latching onto it, signing onto it, um, and one of the reasons that I founded Arlington Green again um, is that I think those kind of efforts very much live and die by the grassroots, mm -hmm. by the people on the streets, by the grocers, by the small farmers standing up and saying, you know, we need to change this, and when there's enough of a groundswell, we can see that things like that can move forward. Looking at Arlington Green, got two last questions. Sure, absolutely. We have to be quick. We only have about uh, 40 seconds. Uh, what do you see as the legacy as of right now of Arlington Green? And the last one would be, what do you see for the future expansion 5, 10, 15 years? Sure. Out? You know, the, as far as the legacy goes, you know, I'd like to, and, and, I'll, and I'll tie my answer to both of those okay. into a, to, no to one. So, you know, I want the legacy 10, 20 years from now to be that Arlington Green um, tried to move the needle in its own small way. Mm -hmm. Even if it was, you know, we were around for five years and we did four or five programs, somebody can look back and say, oh, I remember meeting Sam at an Arlington Green event. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, I was on his show and mm -hmm. I got funding for whatever. Right. Um, you know, that's that's really what I want to, to get out of mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. And the expansion and growth? And the expansion and growth, um, you know, I'd like to think that um, Arlington Green will just be a player within the community and we're going to be the go-to resource when people want to do programs. That's absolutely fantastic. Augustine N. Cruz, Founder and Executive Director, Arlington Green, thank you for being with us. Thank you very much for having me, Sam. Thank you for being with us as we create the Emerald Planet. So they say it's the man's world? I don't see anybody's name on it. While they were doing their thing, we slowly changed all that. Today, women can do anything men can do. And there's one thing we're even better at. Open enrollment is back. Enroll Virginia wants you to get covered for 2016 and beyond. You have until January 31st to enroll in affordable health care. If you wish to have coverage by January 1st, you must enroll by December 15th. That's less than a month from now. Remember, the penalty for not having health insurance next year is a minimum of $695 per person. Don't think twice about it. To find an enrollment event near you or to get free help with the application, visit our webpage or give us a call. 
El periodo de inscripción ha comenzado. Enroll Virginia quiere que tú y tu familia tengan cobertura médica este próximo 2016. Tienes hasta el 31 de enero para inscribirte. Si deseas cobertura desde el 1 de enero, debes inscribirte antes del 15 de diciembre. Recuerda que si no tienes cobertura el próximo año, te multarán una suma mínima de $695 por cada adulto. No lo pienses más y visita nuestra página para más información o para ayuda con la solicitud. Hey, Hard, what's this? That's my resignation letter. You're resigning? Why? Because you're constantly ignoring me. You're half as active as you used to be, and you get stuff like this. You've been putting me under a lot of pressure lately. That's why I'm ready to quit. I forgot. I'll do better. Please, don't quit on me. Okay, but remember, it's not what you say. It's what you do. Listen to your heart. Don't let it quit on you. Let's go for a walk. Uncontrolled high blood pressure could lead to a stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range before it's too late. back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you on a week-to-week -week basis looking for those thousand best practices. Such best practices, technology, services, products, and of course the people are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And as we go to a planet of 9 billion people by 2050, how are we going to be able to provide the food, the fuel, the fiber, all the basic infrastructure that's needed? And I have a gentleman sitting right beside me, David Weitzel, who is the chief of conspiration. He's going to uh, let us know what that actually means. A regenerative agriculture sector um, accelerator. This is... Uh, very fancy terminology you got there. It goes under RASA. So anyway, we're glad to have you here, Dave. Thanks a lot, Welcome Sam. Welcome to, to the Amber Planet TV. And it's, it's fun to have you because you're working with really some outstanding people. This regenerative uh, agriculture, I think, is one of the, the largest, fastest moving activities and projects on the planet right now because you talk with people in India and in China, Australia, Indonesia, it doesn't matter. This keeps coming up. So looking at, tell us uh, about your title, what that okay. actually means, and then also the meaning as far as just the name of your organization. Right, well, so we call it RASA, uh, and it does stand for the Regenerative Agriculture Sector Accelerator. Um, the concept is that there is this growing space of regenerative agriculture around the world, in the United States and in developing countries and, and in Europe, and it needs to, evolve even faster. Mm -hmm. So the goal of the organization is to help it evolve faster. So yeah. we want more people to become more successful. It's a collaboratively based organization. Right now it's all volunteer, so we call it a collaboratory. Um, and um, we essentially are trying to plot new ideas to help the sector go faster. So I, I help to lead the conspiration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost like being conspiratorial, but uh, you have a, a, a good positive bent yeah, on yeah, that yeah. whole thing, yeah. which is which is very good. Uh, looking at, uh, you come out of a background of uh, research, environmentalism, a number of different things. How does the skill set really fit into what you're trying to do now to actually move something that's fairly new, but it's it's growing at a very rapid rate? Yeah. It's, it is very fun to watch it grow. I, I spent a bunch of time working on, um, you know, working on the internet. I helped mm -hmm. start a, a company that does uh, web technology called Forum One Communications. It's actually in Alexandria. Mm -hmm. um, That's and in Virginia in the United States. Alex, Alex, yeah. Alexandria, Virginia. And um, the experience of watching the evolution of the internet is really exciting. So it's gone from kind of nothing in the 1960s mm -hmm. to a pretty dominant infrastructure now. It's really almost everything now. It's very important, right? And it's interesting because nobody owns it. Mm -hmm. And it basically functions because of collaboration. People agree to use the same protocols and that makes the internet work. Yeah. And the question is, can we do that same kind of model in other spaces? For example, in regenerative agriculture. Can we have farmers and suppliers and uh, um, retail outlets and technology developers behaving in a way that we behaved when we built the internet? Mm -hmm. Can we have that kind of Now looking at this image here, this is something that you have as far as this uh, regenerative aspect, as far as agriculture. Help us to define the term. And then how does this graphic actually fit into all that? The 
Um, Regenerative has actually been kind of an expire, inspiring term for me, and I confess I've only been using it for about two years. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that we're not going to be satisfied with a world that's no worse off than we have been living in today. We want a world that's really much dramatically better off. Mm -hmm. We want a phenomenal future. Um, and regenerate, re regenerating what we have is one of the ways that we're going to do that. Mm -hmm. So in a broad sense, regeneration is this possibility of uh, incre incredible improvement in, in the future. In a very narrow sense, in agriculture, you can, you can say regenerative agriculture makes, um, grows nutritious food and healthy plants at the same time that the soil gets richer. Yeah, this is something a friend of mine in Minnesota has talked about for a long time is that he said you always have to start with growing soil. He says you got to take dirt, which he says most of what's on the ground is dirt, and you're growing soil. What does that mean to you, David, as far as this growing soil and then how that fits into this regenerative agriculture? It's really fun because over the last 400 years or more, we've actually been depleting our soil. And one of the indications is that we've been releasing carbon from the soil into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So a large part of our uh, a global warming problem is driven by carbon being released from soil. One of the things that happens when you grow soil is you basically capture the carbon and the biomatter back into the soil mm -hmm. and you sequester carbon. So regenerative farms, one of the benefits that they have is that they help take CO2 out of the air and store it in the soil. Yeah, and then of course we're uh, growing uh, precious products, whatever that may be. We're looking at grapes probably for wine and eating, uh, but really it's, uh, it's the whole nutritional base for all the beings because it's plant, animal, and humans that are all existing on this planet and we have to share all this. Absolutely, and uh, one of the insights with the concept of regeneration is that we don't need to be making some of the trade-offs we uh, have traditionally made. Uh, there was a, an event recently uh, in DC where they had large agricultural manufacturers come in and participate in the conference. And it, the conference title was, how do we grow enough food for people that will make the people happy? And we minimize our impact. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're minimizing your impact, that means you're doing damage. So why would we plan to do damage? Why wouldn't we grow enough food that people really want that improves the environment mm -hmm. at the same time. Now, they're saying as far as uh, food right now that uh, I've read research, it says we're producing enough food for 12 to 13 billion people, which is what they're projecting at the end of the, the century. And yet uh, we have 7.3, 7.4 billion on the planet and people go to bed hungry. So where's the disconnect in all this, David, and how, again, does this fit back into this worldwide movement as far as regeneration of the earth, but also regeneration of humans, animals, and plants yeah. for the benefit of all? A lot of the uh, examples that we've been looking at for regenerative uh, projects are in developing countries. Um, Ashoka, the um, organization in Roslyn, Virginia, that. Uh, Bring, that finds social entrepreneurs around the world has recruited a bunch of agricultural fellows. One of my favorite projects is in, in Zambia, and uh, the farmer there wanted to help protect elephants from poaching, and a lot of the poaching is done by small land farmers. So he's developed a cooperative where he buys the products from the farmers if they agree not to poach animals, wild animals. So at the same, so he's now producing uh, peanut butter and honey for the international market. The biodiversity in the area has increased. The uh, and one of the interesting byproducts has been there used to be a famine part of the year for that area of Zambia. That part of the year has gone away, so there aren't people starving. So part of the goal of regenerative farming is that we actually it's not even just carbon. We're gonna we can clean the water. We can increase biodiversity. We can have uh, more interesting jobs. We can have tastier food. We can have wider variety of food. And sounds compelling. It, Why aren't we doing it? <laughs> that's the, that's the goal. Why aren't we doing it faster? So we need to accelerate it. Well, we had a, a program similar to this. Actually, this will be uh, you know the third program. So we're going to twelve different shows uh, on this topic. And in the very first one we did is about the you know the movement of cattle in very classical traditional ways on the African continent. Uh, they're doing it in Inner Mongolia and China. Actually, I'm working with a guy going back 10 years now that started doing this before people even heard of it, and uh, and he's having profound impact. And then in the West, uh, they decided they're going to start moving the cattle, and all of a sudden in two years the beaver showed up, 
and they had a stream that had been dormant for over 15 years, all of a sudden started, quote unquote, sprouting water. Now, they, they don't know where the beaver came from because the closest beaver was almost 400 miles away. So how does this all work together? Because almost all this seems like magic. It does seem and like it, magic, And it, it is it? magic it's... of the fact that you're allowing nature to renew itself. Yeah. I think that's where you actually are going with this whole concept, but explain it for us. I, I, and I don't think I can explain all of it. I think a lot of it does look like magic, but these are the stories that we're seeing and the, and the documentation is getting better and better. The uh, message, I think, is, is that we're not trying to remove people from nature. We belong in nature. We're part of nature. Um, and so uh, there, is, there is problems with our model that we we can somehow control it or determine the direction of it. So I think we need to we need to think farther ahead. I, I talk a little bit about the idea that we are in an Anthropocene. We're in an era that's kind of determined by mankind. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing it by mistake. We've been doing it in denial. And what we really need to do is do it intentionally. We mm -hmm. need to engage in nature and take our responsibility for being stewards and con contributors into nature. And regeneration helps us do that. Now, looking at uh, COP21, uh, this is this uh, global agreement, uh, really one of the first global agreements that people, uh, after 30 years or so, decided that we really need to do this and we need to do it eagerly, not just begrudgingly go into it. So how do you see that impacting on this regenerative agriculture movement? But how do you see regenerative agriculture impacting on the United Nations, its functions, and the agreements that are coming out of this? Because these agreements now are coming you know, faster and more of them, uh, but in mostly in very positive ways, it seems like. It does seem like they're making progress, and progress that people were betting heavily against. Um, the uh, French have taken the lead on trying to promote uh, soil uh, as a opportunity to sequester carbon. So they have a four per 1,000 program that they've been pushing and it's become, it was part of the last COP and it will continue to be part of the next COP. And the idea is that if we can get um, the farmers to participate in regenerative approaches, we will sequester carbon, removing it from the air, and that that will be part of the answer to uh, slowing and then eventually reversing climate change. Now looking at this uh, urban agriculture, because this is something when you have 80% of your people in urbanized areas, we need to you know, start focusing on this urbanization that's going on. How do you see that fitting into this? Because we classically think of all this going on somewhere out there, you know, the ranchers and the foresters and the fisher persons and, and uh, you know, the real farmers that are, you know, planting and uh, harvesting the crops and all that. But urban areas, we've got billions of acres that actually could be brought into productivity and people could be eating out of their backyard instead of having to buy something that comes, you know, 15,000 miles away. Yeah. How do we, and this is our 30 seconds, how do we bring that in which helps you to evolve Rasa? I mean, one of the things that we're seeing that's really exciting are the, are the schools with, with, with gardens and farms. And the First Lady's been great at kind of promoting and, and demonstrating this ability. But yeah, we're bringing farms and, and growing things right back into the cities, and it's, it's a natural place for that to happen. What do you see expansion of your organization 5, 10, 15 years out? You know, 15, 20, 25 years out, we don't want to be talking about regenerative agriculture. That, that's just what agriculture is. Yeah, just, it just needs to be that way. Yeah. This is David Watson, the uh, chief of conspiration uh, with uh, RISA and thank you for being with us and thank you for being with us as we talk about this very important topic of regenerating agriculture, soil, land, air as a great animal planet. Sabe usted que su voto cuenta? Como votar en ausencia? Día de las elecciones es el 8 de noviembre y su voto cuenta. Su voz es su voto. ¿Va a estar lejos del condado de Fairfax en el día de la elección? Es muy fácil votar si no estás en Fairfax. ¿Usted trabaja o comutar más de 11 horas por día? ¿Es usted un cuidador principal de una persona enferma en casa? Estas son algunas de las razones por las que un votante registrado para votar en ausencia. Los votos por correo 
deben ser recibidos por la oficina de elecciones de a las 7 p.m. el 8 de noviembre. La votación en persona ausente ya está disponible para lunes a sábado en las ubicaciones del condado de Fairfax, en el centro de gobierno, y los satélites hasta el 5 de noviembre. Para horas y lugares, visita el sitio web de la Liga de Mujeres Votantes. El éxito de nuestra democracia depende de la participación y tu votación de todos los ciudadanos. Usted puede ser la fuerza que provoca el cambio, el progreso en nuestro país que cuenta con su opinión, su futuro depende de su voto. Votación es realmente importante. We're back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. and the United States on a week-to-week -week basis as we're looking around the globe in 144 different nations. Looking at countries that are really on the leading edge as far as working with the United Nations, working with each other, and working in a collaborative spirit as how we're going to address severe and sometimes violent climate change. At the same time, to be able to enhance not just protect, but enhance the quality of the air, the soil, the water as we move through the 21st century. And we have a gentleman who's actually working on all this. This is Ronnie Cummins. He's coming in by Skype, uh, International Director for Organic Consumers Association. And also he's a steering committee member for Regenerative, uh, put in Agriculture International. And then we have set it right, sitting right beside me is uh, Augustine, goes by Augie. Uh, who is the executive director for the Arlington Green here in Arlington, Virginia. And thank you for being in the studio. And uh, Ronnie, thank you for being here. Good to be with you today. I'm glad to have you. Uh, say, tell us a little bit about uh, the two different hats uh, that you're wearing. One is that you have this Organic Consumers Association and then also with the Regeneration uh, International. Tell us about both of those. And actually, we have uh, both of your logos here, so if we can put up this uh, slide here so our audiences here and abroad can see uh, the two organizations that you're part of, Ronnie. And thank you for being here. Yes, well, the Organic Consumers Association is a large network of several million organic consumers in the United States. And we've always, uh, in the 18 years we've been around, we've always promoted organic food and farming, uh, fair trade, uh, sustainability issues. Uh, two years ago at the Climate March in uh, New York City, uh, we joined together uh, with uh, activists from all over the world to set up this group called Regeneration International. Our founding members are in about 25 countries and we're dedicated to promoting regenerative food farming and land use so that we can not only address climate change and other burning issues like world hunger, but actually start to reverse climate change and uh, the problems that go along with it. Yeah, looking at that, if we can adjust that slide so we can see the uh, Regeneration uh, International emblem there, I think that's important. Uh, but looking at it, why is this Regeneration International so important as far as the work that you're doing with the Organic Consumers Association, but also uh, folds into this regenerative agriculture movement that really is just taking off like wildfire, you know, all over the planet? Yes, I, th I think, you know, most people will agree that if we don't solve this climate crisis and the, the problems that go along with it, uh, you know, the market share of organics and so on aren't going to matter that much in 25 years. We must, as a global community, step up to the plate and address this issue and solve it. And the great thing is that uh, regenerative food and farming are really just a continuation of the organic 
uh, farming movement. It's just taking it to the next level. Uh, I think 20, 20, 25 years ago when we started developing national organic standards in the U.S., we didn't understand the climate crisis and the, the crisis of the soil and so on, as well as we do today. So we didn't have organic standards that were fully regenerative. But now we're starting to understand that soil health and the health of our you know, our, our croplands, grasslands, forests, wetlands, and so on are absolutely essential. And so we're coming together as a global community uh, to solve this problem. Last year, we brought about 90 people from around the world to the Paris Climate Summit. Uh, next week, we're going to bring uh, a whole bunch of people, uh, including myself, to Marrakech, Marrakech Morocco, uh, to actually start implementing this French 4 for 1000 initiative and starting to deal with this issue of promoting regenerative food and farming on a global scale. Looking at uh, this uh, Paris uh, Climate Summit, we're talking about reaching zero fossil fuel emissions by 2050. And, but at the same time, they're saying that that's only going to reach 50% of the goal as far as to stop and hopefully reverse this negative impact on the climate from the severe climate changes going on around the globe. So uh, what else needs to be done and why only 50 percent then? Uh, why not go for the whole 100 percent as far as what we need to do in order to not only stop but reverse severe climate yeah. change? Well, I think the consensus among global scientists is that we've got to bring uh, the atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases back down to it where it was approximately uh, uh, at the beginning of the Industrial uh, Revolution. Uh, that's if we want to have a stable climate with predictable rainfall and be able to grow all the food that we need uh, and preserve biodiversity. So uh, if we go down to zero emissions from fossil fuels by 2050, which certainly uh, all the countries of the world have agreed we need to do. Uh, by 2050, we're still going to be at about 450 parts per million of CO2. Uh, and the consensus among scientists is that's uh, 100 or 150 parts per million higher than what we will need to arrest uh, the melting of the, glo uh, the glaciers and the, the polar ice caps, the rising of the seas, the uh, advent of more and more violent weather, more and more droughts and that. Yeah. So we need to not only stop putting uh, greenhouse gases up into the atmosphere, we need to draw down uh, a significant amount, uh, around 250 billion tons optimally, that are already up there. And there's only one, one way that we know of to uh, suck down and re-sequester uh, carbon and put it in the soil and put it in the trees uh, and that is through, uh, you know, uh, increased photosynthesis, uh, regenerative food and farming. We've got to restore the health of our soils, that uh, 300 billion tons of carbon that used to be in the soil and the forest before we started uh, plowing it all up and cutting all the trees down. We've got to get it back down uh, in, into the soils, uh, and in, do, in so doing, we'll also increase soil fertility and the capacity of the soil to uh, hold water, rainfall, will also in, in improve animal health and human health as well. Yeah, and I was going to say the whole thing about this is when you start to improve uh, the soil quality, then you're directly impacting as far as the air and water quality at the same time, and these are almost a uh, symbiotic uh, relationship. But uh, we're doing very well with our Skype connection. Thank you, Ronnie. So, uh, Augie, why don't you ask the next question? Absolutely. Um, and, Ronnie, it's good to see you. Um, so, the, the little-known French 4-4-1000 initiative was signed by 29 uh, nations as well as several hundred civil society organizations uh, since the Paris Climate Summit. And it's been described as possibly, quote, the most important international climate initiative in the world today. So can you tell us a little bit about what is the initiative and why it is so important? Yes, I mean, it was signed last December 1st at the Paris uh, Climate Summit in France. Uh, it didn't get a lot of publicity in the mass media, but it is extremely important. When we did a teach-in at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., 
uh, in March uh, and in April, excuse me, of last year and October the previous year, uh, we had a very interesting gathering. What it basically is, it's the idea that we have to start sucking down uh, as much greenhouse gas from the atmosphere as we're putting up there. So right now uh, in the world, we're putting up about 10 billion tons of carbon equivalent up into the atmosphere every year. Uh, the oceans and the, and the soil and the forests are, are sucking down about 3.5 of that billion. So we got this net increase every year of, uh, of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that are, that are heating up the planet. And we've got to stop doing that. And the brilliance of the French plan uh, is just its simplicity that if you look around the world at uh, farmers who are farming regeneratively, ranchers who are grazing their animals regeneratively, uh, programs of reforestation and preserving of wetlands and restoring damaged landscapes, we easily can start to suck down and re-sequester in the soils and the forests as much as we're putting up there. And as we continue to reduce our fossil fuel, that is the amount that we're putting up into the atmosphere, we will actually have a net decrease uh, in the amount of carbon and other carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the environment. So there is no other way uh, if we're going to get safely back to where we need to be in terms of climate stability uh, and you know preserve all of our uh, soil from being eroded and degraded. Uh, and this uh, violent weather that's already disrupting crops and, you know, threatening mass starvation around the world. We yeah, I've, I've been using uh, much of the language that you're using, even the, uh, the arrest aspect. In other words, arrest the uh, severe climate change and uh, try to reverse. Uh, many people have kind of chided me on that, and I'm glad to hear that there are other th others thinking in the same way, because we have to get very busy at stopping where we are and then start reversing back to, you know, the, the old norms 50, 60, 70 years ago. And that's where we need to be in all this. But you have a very uh, simple motto, and I like this. This goes to the concept of the French and simplicity, uh, but with your Regeneration International, cool the planet and feed the world. I'll say it again, cool the planet, feed the world. And we only have about uh, less than a minute to do all this, Ronnie. How are we gonna do that? Okay, well, you look at the world, we've got about four million acres of cropland, we've got about eight or nine million acres of rangeland and 10 million acres of forests. We have to start sequestering carbon in all these areas. Uh, we can do that as demonstrated by, you know, five to 10% of the farmers and ranchers across the world are already doing this. Uh, but we need to get a larger number doing this. And as we do this, we're also gonna increase soil fertility. We're gonna really undermine the, ca the causes of rural poverty around the world. Uh, we're gonna reduce conflict and strife at the same time. So by, by recarbonizing the soil, uh, we will also be refertilizing the soil. We'll be producing healthier food and animals and we'll be, be producing uh, in rural areas uh, more, more money for the small farmers and ranchers, which is what they need right now. Well, I think what the work that you're doing, and I, I really like this motto that you have here, is that, you know, cool the earth and uh, feed the world. So I think it's absolutely fantastic. This is Ronnie Cummins, International Director, Organic Consumer Association, and member of Regeneration International, and we break the Emerald Planet. books at the library.
I know. There's more than just books at the library. I don't want to be hooked to a machine. I want all the medical treatment available to me. I wouldn't want my family to have to make this decision. My doctor knows what's best for me. An advanced directive is your life on your terms. Talk with your family. Decide what's right for you. Then put it in writing. Documenting my wishes today means my family won't have to make heart-wrenching decisions later. To learn more, visit www.putitinwriting.org. 1,200 American youth run away from their homes every day. The National Runaway Switchboard is here to help. 1-800-RUNAWAY. If you are a runaway, thinking about running away from home, or a parent or guardian concerned about issues facing your child, call us 24 hours a day. 1-800-RUNAWAY. In times of crisis, hope is just a phone call away. 1-800-RUNAWAY. It's coming right to your neighborhood. And when it does, you may be surprised. It's your Social Security Statement of Your Benefits, and it's going to help you plan your financial future. Your benefit statement will tell you how much Social Security you're eligible to receive and when you'll get it. Then you'll know how much you need to save for retirement, because that's coming too. The future is in your hands. Choose to save. to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, technology, services, products as we move through the 21st century. And as we're moving forward, how are we going to actually enhance the quality of life for the some 9 billion people that will be on the planet by 2050? Not just to exist and not to be uh, subservient to, uh, you know, the, the moneyed elites around the globe, but those that actually can uh, use and grow and prosper wherever they may be in the over 214 countries and territories. And that's really what we're all talking about as far as this regenerative uh, agriculture. And also we have someone that's coming on to give us a very unique perspective. This is Sarah Day Evans. She's a founding director of what's called Accelerating Appalachia and Prosperity uh, Collective. I like that uh, name. And uh, David Weitzel, who is the chief uh, of Conspiration, uh, in regenerative agriculture sector accelerator. That's quite a name that you have there. That's gold-plated for sure. And uh, thank you for being in the studio with us, David. Thanks, and sir. Sarah Day is uh, coming in by Skype. And Sarah, I believe you're here. I am here. Okay, Sarah, uh, it's, uh, it looks like uh, we've all disappeared off of our uh, set here, but uh, we're very much alive and well. But anyway, uh, talking about this uh, Appalachia uh, accelerating Appalachia. Tell us about that. What is that and uh, why is that important? Uh, I know well Appalachia. I'm from that area and uh, right. it's a very important area of the United States. So tell us about this Appalachia uh, 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 Appalachia accelerating and then also this Prosperity Collective. I'm trying to get all these names in proper order here. Go ahead. Sure. Um, Good to know. I think you're from Blacksburg. If I'm That's not correct. Southwest and Virginia. And I'm Skyping in from, from Kentucky. Um, Accelerating Appalachia is a nature-based business accelerator. And what we mean when we, we talk about nature-based businesses, these are businesses that are solving for our basic needs of food, clothing, shelter, and wellness. But they're solving in a way that is regenerative um, of the people that they work with as well as the nature of our region um, and so we're absolutely focused on regenerative agriculture but it's a bit broader because 
Um, some of our businesses are, for instance, forest product companies. Mm -hmm. Right. Who are uh, sustainably or regeneratively harvesting, actually putting back into the ecosystem in ways that is not often uh, done with current practices, for instance, in, in the building industry. Tell us a little bit about, Sarah Day, about Appalachia, you know, in, in quotation marks, because it's, it's a long way from uh, New York all the way down into uh, Georgia. So that's, that's a long string well, as far as Appalachia is concerned. Appalachia. And, uh, and then how uh, that area really is unique and different because uh, roughly 80% of the population in the United States live in urban areas. Uh, and even though there are a number of urban areas, you know, in the Appalachian chain, uh, still, it's very rural in many areas with lots of forest and, and other natural areas. So tell us what's unique about that and how that really is becoming a linchpin as far as what needs to be done on the east coast of the United States, which has the bulk of the American population, and the carbon that's being emitted from the cities, the cars, the factories, the buildings in this area and how really you're becoming a huge carbon sump uh, for this whole region of the United States. Well, Appalachia is actually um, one of the most biodiverse regions in the world. It's in the top five most biodiverse regions um, across the globe. It has recently been recognized as the most diverse food shed in North America. And that's not, that's due, yes, to the natural abundance of the region, but it's also due to the culture of resilience of the folks living in that region, passing down practices such as seed saving and keeping the seeds, uh, heirloom seeds, going through generations and uh, the deep and long practice of, of craft work and makers, uh, which we is a, you know, makers is a hip thing these days, but for Appalachia, folks have been making something out of very little for a very long time. Um, and so from that biodiversity and that that food biodiversity has, are springing up across the region. Um, these kinds of businesses that I'm speaking to, fiber farming, um, natural forest products, and then of course a, a large, uh, a wide variety of regenerative uh, food businesses. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make a distinction about the kinds of businesses that we accelerate and how they re link to farming practices and these kinds of regenerative um, agri uh, 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 harvesting practices. So we accelerate businesses that are hiring lots of farmers, um, small farmers, and they are able, these businesses in food farming, a craft brewing and distilling, drinking is an agricultural act, um, and natural building they are hiring multiple family farmers and wild crafters and harvesters um, amongst our 35 businesses right now um, we've got at least 500 family farms being uh, supported and so those businesses can influence the practices of the farmers because they're their customers Mm -hmm. And so some of the farmers are using regenerative practices, some are not yet, but we can help them get there. Um, we've added in a new component, a, re a holistic management component um, to our uh, agenda, uh, to our curriculum, um, values-based metrics that are passed along to the businesses through our program and then that can be passed along to the farmers. Well, Sarah Day, it sounds very exciting and, uh, and and you really brought this out because being from that area, you're talking about how this is very new, but it's been there only for the last 400 years as well as people move from the coast uh, you know, into the Appalachian chain and across and uh, moved across the, the United States, the continent. Uh, 
David, it looks like we're doing very well for our Skype. Why don't you ask the next question, please? Uh, thanks, uh, Sarah Day. It's great to see you. Hey, um, David. Nice to see you. And I know that you've been doing, you, you spent some time in California, if I recall correctly, and you are uh, doing some, some cross-fertilization here. You're sprinkling a little bit of Silicon Valley pixie dust in, in the Appalachian <laughs> region. Can, can you talk a little bit about what an accelerator is and, and, and how, it, how you're making it work? What kinds of things are you doing? Sure, thanks for that, and that is true. I was in the Bay Area for eight years and several years in the D.C. area. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a wanderer, an explorer, but I'm a sixth generation Kentuckian, so it always calls me back. Um, so an accelerator, just a typical accelerator, is one that is, uh, it came out of Silicon Valley, I believe, um, and it's, a, it's a, an intensive program for growth stage or startup businesses and generally is focused on tech and businesses that are designed to uh, grow quickly, three to five years, sell, investors make uh, a chunk of money, uh, as do the founders, and um, everybody goes home happy. Um, that's the idea behind the typical accelerator. We are definitely not that typical accelerator, although we are focused on quick uh, on businesses that are in growth because we really want to help these businesses overtake the economy um, quickly. We think we need to um, to quickly move into regenerative agriculture practices and these kinds of business, uh, regenerative business practices. So we are focused on that in a fast way. Um, it's a program that it spans 12 weeks, but it's actually 10 intensive days held in uh, two to three day workshops. And we take our entrepreneurs, um, and by the way, we, we have an application process. We generally get 80 to 100 applications for 10 slots. Um, and they come in from all over the globe. Um, just to, to add that note that we are expanding to work with entrepreneurs also from outside the region. Um, that's just, that's so fantastic, much. Sarah Day. Looking at uh, this whole thing as far as uh, abroad and uh, going way beyond the Appalachian chain that you are, what are some of the unique things that you believe can be replicated in these communities, and then what some of the things that you feel like that needed to change to make it more adaptable uh, to communities, not only in other areas of the United States, but overseas as well, because today everything is becoming uh, internationalized no matter where we are and what we're doing. Right. Um 15% of our applicants are from outside the country. And we are working on our model so that it is something we can make available, it can be taught, um, and we can train the trainers, and that communities can pick this up and work with uh, nature-based businesses in their region. Um, so actually, we're right in the process of, of making this a replicable uh, model mm -hmm. that we can make available out across the globe. Um, yes, I'd love to travel a bit. Uh, I do always love that, but more so than that is is making sure that you've got the stakeholders in that community that get it, that want to make it happen, and helping them to make that happen. Well, looking at it, it looks like we've uh, absolutely run out of time. This is absolutely fantastic, uh, Sarah Day Evans founding director of Accelerating Appalachia and Prosperity Collaborative. That's a fantastic name, almost as, uh, as long as yours uh, there, David. David Weitzel and with uh, Rasa. And thank you for being with us. David, thank you for being on Emerald Thanks Planet TV as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet.